Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back this morning. And uh, I know Easter was last week, but I think we can still say it today, right? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Right. And, and it doesn't matter because it still goes on, right? And we can still remember that, uh, that message of Easter year round. Um, and, you know, I'm a teacher, so kids ask me questions. And so I'm, I'm good at thinking about questions. And, you know, I mean, I was thinking this week, you know, I mean, Jesus rose from the dead, right? And was that, should have that been the end of the story? Should it just have stopped right there and everybody just, you know, finished and like, this is done, right? But God left us here, right? And, and reading from Matthew, um, and this is, this is why we're still here. Um, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we're still here for a reason, you know. And uh, just uh, just good, uh, good thought for us all to be thinking about. There are two important announcements in your, um, in your bulletin. Number one, there isn't any uh, evening uh, activities tonight. Uh, those will uh, start back up again next week, so be ready for those. Um, but number two is not in the bulletin, but... Uh, a week from Saturday, so on the 24th, that's the last Saturday of the month, uh, there'll be a spring cleanup time. Uh, there is a sign-up uh, on the bulletin board in the back. Uh, it'll be from 8 o'clock in the morning to 2 p.m. in the afternoon. There'll be some refreshments and just a bunch of different projects and things around here to uh, just kind of 
uh, made things nice and get everything cleaned up after a, after a winter. So uh, if you've got time, even if you come for just part of it or all of it, um, that'll definitely be, uh, definitely be great. Um, <clears throat> uh, the first song we're going to be singing here in a moment um, as, we, as we begin our worship together uh, is Come People of the Risen King. And um, one of the, one of the uh, lines in that that I really, really speaks to me is, uh, Come those whose joy is morning sun and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell of battles won and those struggling in the fight. And no matter where, we, where our hearts are this morning, um, God, is a, God has something to speak to every one of our hearts this morning. And um, just, uh, just listen for what he, what he wants, to, uh, wants to tell each of us uh, this morning. So if you're able to stand, please stand, and we'll, uh, we'll begin worship. Come, people of the risen King, who delight to bring Him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to of mercy reach to gather children in. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, struggling in the fight. For his perfect love will never change, and his mercies never cease. But follow us through all our days with the certain hope of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, rejoice. Come young and old from every land, men and women of the faith. Come those with full or empty hands, find the riches of His grace. Over all the world His people sing, shore to shore we hear them call. The truth that cries through every age, our God is all in all. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, Question any of his words. Who 
can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous seeds? Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Who has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man? God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus, Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on the throne, come let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can
What a friend we have in Jesus. Do you feel it? It doesn't actually matter. Right? You have a friend in Jesus even when you don't feel it. Especially when you don't feel it. Uh, Psalm 116, 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's a precious verse, right? But, but be careful there. It doesn't say that death is precious. It says you are. You matter so much to the Lord that in your neediest, weakest moment, that moment is precious to him. I think of Stephen as he's being stoned. He looks up to heaven and he sees Jesus what? Standing at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is standing for Stephen. And we are precious to him too if we put our faith in him. And so this morning we're going to talk about death and what happens when you die and about what we know from the Bible about heaven. So let's talk to our Father now. Father, we do think of those in our church, those close to our church who are, who are near death. I think of Dan Curry's daughter-in-law, Christy Curry, who now is only alert a couple hours a day. We know she doesn't have long to, to be with her family until your son returns and raises her body. But we, we pray for her husband, her children, her family as they mourn. I think of Tiffany Schaffner's grandfather, who also doesn't have many months longer, we think, and we pray that before he dies, he would make clear in his own heart and for his loved ones that he does know Jesus, that he has put his faith in you. We think of those in our church now who have COVID or are coming out of it. Mary Sue, who just tested positive last night, we pray for her and her journey that it won't get too severe. Thank you for Scott and Karen and Theron and Duanda and Jan. As they are now coming out of it, we pray that you would help them to keep um, getting stronger each day. For Sue Peckham, who's waiting on the medication that she needs so she can rejoin us, I pray you give her encouragement and Dave. For Matt and Tammy Erste's daughter, who's giving birth any time now, Kayla, we pray for a healthy delivery for this baby. And for Kevin and Janet Pike's daughter, Courtney, Father, you've been so kind to us and to her and to them. We asked uh, for four weeks, and now we ask for three weeks. We pray that these triplets would not come until it's time. We pray for a healthy delivery, and we thank you for answering our prayer so graciously. You are, you've been so kind to us. And we, just, we ask for three weeks more. And now as we bring our burdens to you from the week, our sins, we confess our sins to you, our guilt and our shame, we lay them all on your son. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for taking them away from us. And thank you for the hope, and not just the hope, but it's a promise. We have a Jesus promise that death does not have the last word, that our weakest moment will be followed by the best moment yet. Father, we don't know what we'd do in the face of death if we didn't know Jesus. We pray for our loved ones, even now, who don't yet know him. May you draw them to yourself. And now we want to continue in our, our prayers, prayers that we sing of worship to your son. In his name we pray, amen. Let's stand and continue our prayers.
my King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, so bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever be. stretch of our Christian worldview series and so oh and I just messed up we need scripture reading I always do this Dave please come and read from Psalm 90 Psalm 90 this is the Psalm of Moses reading Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, you children of men. For a thousand years are in your sight, but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep men away as with a flood. They are as a dream in the morning. They are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. For we are consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are troubled. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away in your wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore and ten. 
And if by reason of strength, four score years, yet is their span trouble and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? Even according to your fear, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion upon your servants. O satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work appear unto your servants, and your glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Thank you, Dave. We are in the home stretch of the series on the meaning of life, or sometimes called the Christian Worldview series. And so far, we've said the Bible has a plot, creation, fall, and redemption. And we've been focusing on redemption now the last several weeks. The last uh, two weeks ago was the cross, the atonement, and then, of course, last week was Easter. And now today, we want to talk about our future. And our future has two parts. Today we want to talk about what happens when you die. And next week, the second part, what happens after that. So what happens when you die, heaven, the intermediate state, what happens after that is what Christians hope for, right? We hope for the three R's, the return of Christ, the resurrection of the body, and the restoration of all things. So that'll be next week. But to this week is before all that happens. Between death and your resurrection, what is that period like? I've noticed that funerals have a lot of confusion, right? A lot of really sloppy theology is expressed at funerals. Basically, whatever the person did well on earth, we say they're doing right now better up there, right? So if they were a baseball player, they are slugging home runs now on God's baseball team. If they were a golfer, they're hitting all the celestial fairways. If they, were a music, if they were a musician, they're now jamming in heaven's band. Right? If they were a pain in the neck, they are really annoying right now. All right, so, like, but I always think, well, how do you know this? Right? Their body's right there. I can see their body. Right now, they're a disembodied soul. And praise God, they're a soul with Jesus. But they're a soul. What can a soul do? Can a soul hit home runs? Can a soul putt? I don't know. So we, we, there's this tension, right? At a Christian funeral, we want to say there's great comfort that there are friends with Jesus, but also realize the story is not over yet. The end is the best is yet to come. Kind of like when your kids were little, and some of you still have little kids, but um, when my kids were little, we'd let them open one present on Christmas Eve or maybe there's stockings in one present. We save most of the presents for Christmas morning. So kind of like that. When you and I die, if we're in Christ, and only, all this only applies if you're in Christ. If you turn from your sin and put your faith in Christ, this is not a blanket promise for all people everywhere. But if you are, if you are in Christ, then when you die, you get the best present you ever got. You're with the Lord. But that's Christmas Eve. We're also longing for the resurrection of Christmas morning when you get even more than you and, that, and that's next week what happens after that but this week what happens when you die and I want to talk if you look at your notes in the bulletin before we talk about heaven I think it's important to talk about death what happens when you die we need to have a Christian focus Christian perspective on death because death is the reason Jesus came Right? Every religion tries to solve some problem. Right? Islam tries to solve the problem of pride. Buddhism tries to solve the problem of suffering. Hinduism, the problem of bad karma. Well, what is the problem that Jesus solves? It's death. 
So that if you've never been bothered by death, if the thought of your death doesn't trouble you ever in your whole life, I'm pretty sure you've never turned from your sin and put your faith in Jesus. Because why would you? Jesus is the answer for a problem you don't much care about. But if you do care about your death, if it does disgust you, if it terrifies you sometimes, then you already know the only possible solution to that problem is Jesus. He alone is the resurrection and the life. So, as I mentioned last week, we never ever want to minimize death. I, you will never hear me say death is no big deal. Don't worry about it. Get over it. Because if I minimize death, I just minimize Jesus. Because Jesus has beat death. And I want to make much of Jesus. So to make much of Jesus, I have to make much of death. Death is as bad as you think it is and worse. But that's why we have put our faith in Christ. So before we talk about the Christian view, just this honest view, I want to show you just how lost, and our, our, our heart should be brimming with compassion for those who don't know Jesus, because there's nothing they can say about death. And just to illustrate that in your notes, this, there's some quotes here from, remember that book, Tuesdays with Maury? Oprah made it her book of the month club a few years ago. It was written by Mitch Album. Uh, who writes a sports writer for Detroit sports and I guess covering Detroit sports for decades made him qualified to write a book on death. So he, he interviewed his mentor, Maury Schwartz, who was dying of ALS. And it's a very poignant book full of um, what Maury taught him as he's dying. So I've illustrated some of these quotes in, in one from Steve Jobs in these categories. So I've done some research, and you don't have to. Here's what the culture is saying. Here's all you can say about death if you don't know Jesus. First, and you hear this a lot, death is natural. So here's a book from Tuesdays with Maury. Death is as natural as life. The fact that we make such a big hullabaloo over it is all because we don't see ourselves as part of nature. We think because we're human, we're something above nature. We're not. Everything that gets born dies. Right? You've heard that a lot, right? Um, just this week, Prince Philip passed away. I was watching a morning news show and um, the newscaster asked the other person, did he die of natural causes? I thought he was 99 and he was two months shy of 100. Are you suspecting foul play? <laughs> no, it's probably natural, but we said our natural causes, but okay, I know what we mean by that, but actually no. He didn't die of natural causes. He died like we all will die apart from Christ. But death is not natural. Death is not the way God made this world to be. And just because we all die does not mean it's, it may be normal right now in a fallen world, but it's not natural. And think with me, if it was, if death was natural, then what could you do about it? Nothing. If it was natural, what should be done about it? Well, probably nothing, because it's natural. We'd be full of despair if we really thought death was natural. Right, just because something happens a lot does not mean it's natural. And how, how that doesn't even help. Right, if you're um, flying in an airplane and you hear this noise in the right wing and the engine catches fire and sputters out, and you hear another noise on the left wing and that engine kind of sputters out, and the pilot comes on and says, attention people, uh, we just lost all of our power, all of our engines, um, and so prepare yourself to crash, uh, but just so you're, to encourage you, this happens a lot in Asia. Like, doesn't it help? Just because it happens a lot, no, I'm going to die. So just because we're all going to die does not mean it's okay, right? But just so we understand this, that's the best our culture, this is an award-winning, popular book. That's the best people can do if they don't know Jesus. All they're left with, I guess it's just natural. I guess we should just learn to accept it. They try and go further and say, well, here's some reasons why it's not so bad. So here's a quote from Tuesdays with Maury. As long as we can love each other and remember the feeling of love we had, we can die without ever really going away 
All the love you created is still there. All the memories are still there. You live on in the hearts of everyone you have touched and nurtured while you were here. Death ends a life, not a relationship. So the point is, you're still alive even after you die as long as people remember you. You live on in their memories. Right? That's, oh, that's kind of, that's touching. Okay, when's the last time you had a thought about your great-grandparents? Marvin kids, you don't count. You just saw them last week. But for most of us, we haven't even thought or don't even know our great-grandparents. Well, if that's all you got, when you die, two generations, you're out of sight, out of mind, I guess out of existence. That doesn't really help. Or you hear, number three, well, you need to die to have meaning in life. Things only have meaning if there's closure. So you can't ever tell who won the game until the clock runs out. You don't know when to clap after a performance until the lights come up. You don't know when a sermon ends until the preacher says amen. Even in a sentence, one word has to die or stop for the next word to begin. So it is true that you have to have endings or closure to have meaning, right? That, that makes sense. But you don't have to die to have that. You can just have end this segment. You don't have to have death. If death was necessary to have meaning in life, well then what's gonna, what will life be like on the new earth? When Christ returns and resurrects our bodies, then will, there'll be no more death or mourning or po- crying or pain. No more death. Will we walk around pulling our hair full of existential angst? What does my unending life even mean? Now, you don't, have to, you don't have to die to have meaning, just closure. Or sometimes, number four, we hear that death is good because it makes room for others. This comes from Steve Jobs, uh, who invented your iPhone and comu- Apple computer. He gave a famous Stanford commencement speech in which he talked about his own demise. He had uh, pancreatic cancer that actually took him. But here's what he said in that very famous speech. Death is very likely the single best invention of life. It is life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you. But someday, not too long from now, college graduates, you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. So, it's okay, kids. When someone dies, uh, they get, it creates room for new people. Okay, that's true. But how much did that help Steve? as he lay dying of cancer. Yeah, Steve, this hurts. This stinks for you, but think about the young guy who's going to get your job and provide for his family. It's all good. That doesn't really help at all, does it? Or we hear, this is from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She gave us those famous five stages of, of, um, of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, I think she was hung up on denial herself because she said, when people die, they very simply shed their body much as a butterfly comes out of its cocoon. Okay, now we're just making stuff up. (laughs) But, But realize, again, compassion, right? This is the best you've got. If you don't know Jesus, you cannot look death in the eyes honestly. You have to lie. You have to tell yourself lies. You have to tell yourself it's not as bad as you know in your gut it really is. There is nothing about death that I am looking forward to. I don't want to die. I don't want to be cremated. That sounds horrifying. I don't want to be put on the ground and just slowly rot. That's disgusting. The whole thing is just, yuck. I hate it. And that's okay. We need to be honest about death so that we can put our hope in Jesus. So the Bible gives us uh, hope. Actually, before we get to the hope, I skip number six in your notes. The Bible very honestly looks at, looks at death and says, death is our enemy. It's our very first enemy. In Genesis chapter two, the first negative thing that's spoken of in the whole Bible is death. In chapter two, verse 17, God says to Adam, if you eat of this tree, you will die. In the next chapter, you ate of the tree, and now you're going to die. 
So death is the very first negative thing in the Bible. It's also the last negative thing. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, Satan is thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Four verses later, death is thrown in. Death lingers even after the devil is gone. Death is literally the last thing to go. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul calls death the last enemy. It's our first enemy in Scripture. It's our last enemy. As Dave read from Psalm 90, it's our enemy in the middle, right? Right in the middle of Scripture. As Dave read, a Psalm of Moses. He said, if you live for 70 years, well, that's about right. And uh, we're all going to die someday. Death, the Bible wrings its hands over death in the beginning, in the middle, so it can set up our great salvation in Christ in the end. Scripture is dead eyed, honest about death so that we can put our hope in Christ. And as we celebrated last week, the only hope anyone has in the face of death is that Jesus has died in our place and then rose again to establish our place. Jesus and only Jesus has defeated death forever. What a gift. That's why, we're, that's why we follow Jesus. He has conquered our greatest enemy. So in the face of that, how do we respond? Um, this is the Baptist church, so we like to alliterate. Uh, number one, because of the hope we have in Christ, we lament. What is the first verse you ever memorized? Jesus wept. What a powerful verse. Jesus, who knew he was going to make it all better in just a few minutes, he still mourned for Lazarus and his sisters. And his, the people there said, oh, look how we love them. So we have hope in Christ, but that hope does not eliminate our grief. Uh, Paul says we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. That's true. But we also hope, but not as those who do not grieve. There's a, a tension, right? And if you think about it, our grief, there's a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations, right? So good Christians cry, because Jesus cried. Good Christians lament. And our lamenting is actually a sign of great faith. Because we know our person's death, our friend, our loved one who's died, we know this is not the way it was ever supposed to be. When God made this world, there wasn't, there were supposed to be no funerals. And we know that the funerals will be over when Jesus returns and fixes all things. So we cry out in hope. We claim the promise, but we cry out in hope in grief. Come already. Lord Jesus. That's why the Bible ends with come, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So that tension of grief and hope, hope and grief. And so when we gather for our loved one's funerals, we do want to encourage the people we love. But I've realized it's probably best to talk less. Right? There's this temptation to, if I can just say the right word, if I can just say the magic sentence, I'm going to make this person feel all better. Well, you can't. There's nothing you or I can say that's going to make it all better. And when we try, we start, we tend to mess up. Like we, we say, well, if I just say, at least they didn't suffer long. Or at least, and we, and we, well, at least it wasn't like this other situation. Well, when we say at least, they just hear we're minimizing. So you never, ever want to start a sentence with at least. And also, we should be careful even in our quoting of Scripture. Uh, years ago now, there was a, a principal, I think, of North Point Christian School, uh, Baptist High, Stan Velt, and he lost a son in an accident, and he, he wrote a book about it and said when people came to him, he said it didn't really help in the moment when you told me Romans 8 28 all things work together for good he said that just felt like like the Bible was a club and I was grieving and mourning and I just felt like you were hitting me over the head with with the Bible and here's the point he said it is not your job as my comforter to tell me that all things work together for good it is my job as the grieving father to tell you that uh, oh I need to remember that. So, of course, we believe the promises and we, we claim the promises, but I think it's, it's helpful just to say, um, 
I mourn with you. This stinks. This hurts. And I stand with you. And I join you in longing for the return of Christ. Because when you think about it, the next time we see our loved one, unless we die, the next time is when Jesus returns. For some of, some of us, Jesus' return is going to bring back a whole lot of loved ones. And so we should pray every day what the Lord's Prayer told us to pray, Thy kingdom come. Come today. And every night when we go to bed, we should have this wince of regret. Okay, it didn't happen today. Maybe tomorrow. Because the next time we see Jesus is when we see Jesus, and he'll bring back our loved ones too. So we lament, not without hope, but because of our hope, because of the promise, we, we lament. Uh, secondly, because of the promise, we live. Uh, Steve Jobs, again, in that famous Stanford commencement speech, he told the graduates this, remembering you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You're already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. Oh, that's such good advice, right? Graduates, you're all going to die. So guess what? You're going to lose it all anyway, so go for broke. Well, maybe. Or if I'm going to lose it all anyway, I might as well just sleep in and watch reruns of The Price is Right. Because it makes no difference. Why do you go for broke? Only this reason. This is why. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul gives 58 verses on the resurrection of Christ and what that means for us. And here's the takeaway. Here's the payoff. Verse 58. Therefore, because of the resurrection, my dear brothers and sisters, therefore stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Why should you go for broke? Why should you work hard? Not because you're going to die, but because you're going to live again. Everything you do, no matter how little and how small you think it is, Jesus said, can earn a reward. Even a cup of cold water can earn a reward if you do it in my name. So this afternoon, so tomorrow, as you go about your work and interact with other people in your family, your life does not have to be something spectacular that people want to write about in history books. No matter how insignificant you think you are or your duties are, do them for the Lord and they count. And someday when Jesus resurrects you, he will reward you for those efforts. Because of the resurrection, we now stomp defiantly on the face of death. We say, death, you do not have the last word. This is not over. The risen Lord will someday raise me, and I will live again. So we lament. We live. When the time comes, we let go. A few years ago now, a friend of mine, she was a secretary at the seminary, and she was dying of bone cancer, uh, Jan Alley. And she, that night, one night, Har, her husband said, can you come over? We're not sure she can make it through the night. So, of course, I dropped everything, ran to their condominium, walked to the couch where she's lying, and Jan was just a real straight shooter. She said, how do I do this? I've never died before. Uh, oh. And I, I said some stupid things and fumbled around, and then, um, finally, I think God gave me some words. I said, Jan, you don't do this. This is not the night for you to do anything. You have walked with Jesus for 70 years. This is the night it pays off. You've walked with him for just this moment. Here's what you do. You climb on Jesus' back, and you let him do all the heavy lifting. You let Jesus carry you home. You let Jesus carry you across the Jordan. You just put all your weight, you put all your rest on Jesus. Um, when I was a kid, uh, my parents, when I would go to bed, they would sing this, uh, uh, not sing, uh, it was a bedtime rhyme. Now I lay me down to sleep. Now I pray my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take. That's a good prayer, right? 
And every night as I lay on my mattress, as I transfer my physical weight to the mattress, that's really good practice for transferring my weight to Jesus. Just as I go limp in my bed, so I need to just go limp on Jesus and let go and let him carry me home. Uh, Don Carson tells the story of um, he had a friend who was dying of cancer and that his prayer meeting on a Saturday morning had 300 people gathered to pray for her and the cancer that she had to stop it. And you know how some of these prayer meetings, the longer they go, the more aggressive people get with God and they start almost bossing him around and one person, after an hour, they're saying, uh, they were kind of caught up in the spirit. They said, Lord, you said there are two or three gathered in your name. There you are. We've got 286 people. We demand you heal our friend Mary. And then Don said, when it came to his wife's turn, she said, Lord, we'd be so grateful if you healed our friend. But if not, teach her to die well. And everyone turned like, we have a traitor right in the middle of it. We had momentum. We, we were doing something. What, what are you saying? But later, Mary's husband said, thank you so much for saying that. Because, you know, my wife is dying, and sometimes there can be this conspiracy of healing. Because it's, it's bad enough to be dying, but now you feel you're letting all your friends down. Because they were, if you say you're getting a bad report, and, and it's getting worse, then, oh my goodness, what, what's wrong? And you know what? We're all, unless Christ comes back, I don't care how much faith you have, we're all going to die sometime of something. So because we're in Christ, we lament, we live right now. When the time comes, we're allowed to let go because we know this is not the end. So what happens when we let go? What actually happens in heaven? You know, there's these books, they're called heavenly tourism books, where people, sometimes little boys, they have these visions, they've gone to heaven. It all started with the book, 90 Minutes in Heaven. And then there's another book, the real book, he went the other direction, My 23 Minutes in Hell. And so my joke is, we are one Roman Catholic book away from completing the afterlife trifecta. A book with the title, My Nine Minutes in Purgatory, which felt like forever, because it was purgatory. So... What do we know about heaven? Paul says he actually went to heaven, but he was not allowed to talk about what he saw there, which makes me a little bit skeptical of some of these, what we're hearing, reading today. But here's what we know from Scripture. Luke 23, Jesus said to the thief on, on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. 2 Corinthians 5, when you die, you'll be home with the Lord. Philippians 1, Paul says, I want to depart and to be with Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, God will bring with Christ those who have fallen asleep or died with him. What do those have in common? When you die, you are with the Lord. That's what Scripture tells us. You're with the Lord. And by the way, that's enough to know. Because Jesus is what makes heaven heaven. If heaven could be heaven without Jesus, then why in the world did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? Wouldn't that have been a bummer? Oh, man, Jesus, I was in heaven. Why'd you bring me back now? But why was Lazarus okay with being raised from the dead? Because Jesus was there. And Jesus' presence made Bethany a corner of heaven. So the point about heaven is, is Jesus. So think about that. Your very worst moment, like when you die, you, you've never been weaker never been more helpless, maybe never in more pain. Your worst moment is followed by your best moment ever. Have you thought, like, the first time you see Jesus, how will that go? How will you greet him? Like, what will you say? Do you have your theological question ready? Like, why the Holocaust? Why did my child get cancer? Who wrote Hebrews? Like, no, that's not how that's going to go. Look at Revelation chapter 1. We'll read a few texts from Revelation, the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. We won't read it now, but starting in verse 12, when Jesus' best friend John sees Jesus, 
in all of his revealed glory. In verse 17, John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. That's how that's going to go. When you see Jesus, and you get just a taste of his beauty and his glory, you will fall at his feet like a dead person, and then Jesus will do something like this. He placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. Now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. I'm alive forever, and so are you. And notice this is it's a personal greeting. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus promises to those who overcome, I will give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Jesus will not greet us with some assembly line, off the rack question, like a, like a mall Santa. He will give us a white stone with a new name that only he and I know, that only he and you know. So what makes heaven heaven is Jesus. And of course, because Jesus is there, there's going to be worship. So in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, I'll start in verse 2, we get a glimpse of the worship in heaven. John says, I was in the Spirit, in verse 2, and before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Notice how this picture of heaven, it's opposite of most of our pictures. Our pictures tend to be focused in the center and fuzzy on the edges. This one is clearer on the edges and fuzzy in the center because the center is the throne of God. It seems John's having a hard time getting a clear look at the glory and beauty of God. In verse 4, it mentions these 24 elders, and these elders could be the church, they could be saints of the Old Testament, they could be all the saints. They also could be angels. We're not exactly sure. We know that humans do appear in Revelation 6 and 7. So let's look at Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9 and read this picture of heaven. Revelation 7, verse 9. John writes, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. So heaven is about Jesus and worshiping Jesus. We will know that is the reason why we exist. Nothing can be more satisfying than worshiping Jesus. But we're doing it not just us in Jesus, we're doing it in community. Look back at verse 9. There are people from every nation, tribe, people in language. Notice the size of that. That's a miracle. How did this, how did these people begin? With a hundred, hundred-year-old man, Abraham, and a 90-year-old wife, Sarah, who were childless, and God said, from you, I will make people as many as the stars in the sky, as many as the sand on the seashore. And he did. 
This is a miracle that this many people are here. And they're wearing white robes and palm branches, which means this is a victory celebration. Notice there in verse 9, it's from every nation, tribe, and language. And that reminds me, look back at chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verse 9. They're singing a new song saying, You are worthy, the Lamb, to take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slain, and with, you, with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now verse 10. You have made them to be a, a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This is a sign we'll pick up next week. As great as heaven's victory celebration is, there's a, a, a suggestion there's something more to come. You are priests and you are kings and you are meant to reign on the earth. So just tuck that away. We'll pick that up next week. That heaven is about Jesus and worshiping Jesus, but it's not completely separate from the earth. It's where you go when you die, but there's something more even after that. So the last thing I want to mention this morning is it's called the communion of saints. The Apostles' Creed says, I believe in the communion of saints. Um, the church is one foundation. Remember that hymn? Mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. So we sing about the union, communion of saints. It's in our creed. And Hebrews 12 talks about the, the, the whole church. And here's what that means. We who are alive are part of the church called militant, the church that's still in the fight. And the, our friends who have died in Christ, they're part of the, the, the church triumphant. They're part of that victory celebration in heaven. We're two wings of the church and we're still connected to each other in Jesus. What that means is, if I'm in Christ, and you're in Christ, and she's in Christ, we cannot ever be completely cut off from each other. We're connected to each other in Jesus. And so we can talk to Jesus about our loved ones in heaven. And they also, don't have a verse for this exactly, but they also may talk to Jesus about us. Right? I used to think that when you die, you go to heaven, and it's like this celestial hammock, right? You just, you're just resting in heaven until Christ returns. But Luther, uh, Origen, a lot of important Christian theologians have thought that when you die, there's still work to do. Kind of like if you're playing in a, a football game, you're in the game. If you get injured, you, you're pushed to the sideline. But if you're a good team, teammate, you're still concerned about the game. You're cheering for the players. You, you may coach him up if he's your replacement. You, you can't play anymore, but you're still involved. So something like that, I, I think, when people die, they go to heaven, and they're not just coasting. They, they may be praying. Uh, look at this prayer in Revelation chapter 6. We have one prayer that we know is happening right now in heaven, or will in the future. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. They open the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called, they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer. So notice right now, or in Revelation chapter 6, John sees people in heaven, they're praying. And notice their prayer is, how long? How long means they're still in time. So, you know how sometimes people say when someone dies, they stepped into eternity? Technically, no. Now, let it go when people say that. Don't be a jerk. Don't correct all of it. But actually, only God is eternal. Only God is outside of time. You and I are not eternal. We had a beginning. We don't have an end because we have God's word, God's promise. What we have is not eternal life. Only God has eternal life. What we have is everlasting life. A life that had a beginning, but a life that will never end. So these saints, they're in heaven, but they're not in some eternal state. They're still in time, and they're, and they're impatient. How long? Now notice, there's no suffering in heaven. There's no pain. All tears have been wiped away, but they are impatient. Why? Why? Well, it's a great thing, right? 
What a comfort to be a soul in heaven with Jesus. But you know what's even better? To be a whole person, a soul and a body with Jesus on earth where he has meant us to live. So there, there's impatience right now in heaven. How long, O oh Lord? And they're given white robes and said, wait a little bit longer. So we and our loved ones who died in Christ, we are not cut off from each other. We can tell Jesus to give a hug to them or tell Jesus to pass a word on to them. And they may very well be, be praying for us. So what do we know about heaven? Jesus, worshiping Jesus. There's community and there's still this communion of saints. What a hope that when we die. But as we'll see next week, that's not the end. Our hope is not that we die and go to heaven. Our hope is that Jesus returns and resurrects our body and restores all things. So, my friend Jeff, who's pastoring at Calvary Baptist, when he was up at Indian River Baptist, he said there was a, an older woman in the church, and he had been teaching her what, we, what we've been going through about creation, fall, redemption. And he said it, it, it transformed her life. And she got it, and what a difference this made. But now she was in the hospital, and so we went to visit her, and they talked about um, family and church and hospital food. And then he prayed with her, and he left, and he's almost home. He gets a call from the, the floor nurse. And she says, Char Charlotte wanted me to call you. She's, she's going to die. And she wants you to come back, but take your time. She'll wait. And so, so Jeff raced back to see the hospital and went up to see her. And she, he walks in the room and, and she said, uh, Pastor, tell me the story one more time. And so for the next 20 minutes, Jeff rehearsed with her what we've been going through, creation. God made this world good. He made you in his image. We're the priests and kings to rule on this earth on his behalf. But then, then we, we rebelled against him and we brought sin and death into the world. But God sent Jesus and he died for our sins and rose again. He's going to restore you and, and all things. And, and he was crying and she was crying. And, and then she said, it's true. It's all true. And she said, call for the nurse. And so Jeff called the nurse in and Charlotte said, nurse, I'd like a robe and I'd like my teeth. And so Jeff excused himself and they put a white robe on Charlotte and put her teeth in. And then Jeff came back in and she said, it's okay, it's time. And as Jeff prayed w with her, she looked to heaven and she said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the third thank you she was gone. And the fourth thank you, she was waking up with Jesus. That's the Jesus promise. Right now, Charlotte, her soul is with Jesus. And she's awaiting his return and her resurrected body. If you don't know Jesus, if you're not sure that you have put your faith in him. Honestly, what are you waiting for? Father, thank you for sending Jesus to defeat death so that when, so that when we die, our souls will go to heaven to be with your son. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and the restoration of all things. And we ask if there's anyone here or anyone even watching online who isn't sure that they know Jesus, may you trouble them, fill them with despair over the fact of their future death and help them realize that there is no other place to turn except Jesus. And please graciously, kindly draw them to yourself so they can live forever with us and with you when your son comes to restore all things. In his name we pray, amen.
Let's stand and sing our closing song. It's, it's a new song, but we invite you to join as soon as you know it. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy. That bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving God you're so good God you're so good God you're so good you're so shine to you and be gracious unto you the Lord turn his face toward you may he give you your peace have a blessed Lord's day Amen